you'll hear from Noor Ghazi that she lived in Iraq under sanctions and war. The United States continues to have a presence in Iraq, including 2,500 troops and the world's largest embassy. Iraq sits right next to Iran, putting it quite literally in the middle of the tensions that erupted in May when the Israeli military killed an Iranian diplomat in Syria and missiles flew in both directions over Iraq's territory. Many people seem to forget that when the U.S. launched the so-called Gulf War in 1991, it was our first major operation after the fall of the Berlin Wall. But people also seem to forget that U.S. interference with Iraq has stretched throughout that time, from the imposition of sanctions in August 1990 to today. I usually would like to say by identifying myself as uh, my name is Noor Ghazi and I am a refugee from Iraq. So I'll be talking about my journey and started to, to starting to shed light on some of the events that um, unfolded in Iraq during the 90s and up to 2003 and then um, the chaotic civil war that started uh, or erupted after that. So I was born and raised in uh, Baghdad, Iraq. And as a child, I remember my very first core memory that I have it up to this day is that I was in war, during war, and um, it was dark and I was running towards my mom um, looking for safety. And that was during the 1991, uh, during the bombing campaign that was led by the U.S. on Iraq, after Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, uh, when the ex-Iraqi president Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1990. Um, and then growing up really just under that time of uh, Saddam's regime, the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein. And uh, not only that, it's just like that was not enough, but also living during the economic sanctions that were imposed on Iraq after the Kuwait invasion. So as you see here on the screen, a picture of me and my siblings um, at that time. So on the left, picture of me and my little brother. And then on the right, a picture from the right to the left, me in the middle, my brother, and then on the left, my uh, older sister. So during that time, I, I don't think this was an, an easy time for all Iraqis when um, reflecting and, and recalling memories and the time we lived uh, under the economic sanctions and under Saddam's regime. Um. As a child and during that time, I've always heard the conversation that the economic sanctions, economic sanctions, and that term in Arabic calls hisar. So always adults will be speaking about the hisar will be lifted on Iraq. So the economic sanctions will be lifted from Iraq. And I've all, I, I tried as a little child to put that word hisar into a, something visual where I can understand what, what does hisar mean? Um, and then I'm, I'm going to school. I mean, of course, the, the schools were in a dire situation. So we barely have a desk to sit on and, and one desk, they fit five to six students on one desk. Um, having one pencil, me and my siblings to, to do our homework. And we made sure that we're not going to sharpen that pencil more often just because my parents cannot afford another one. I remember every night before going to school in the morning, me and my siblings would have this conversation on um, who should have the pencil on the first, um, you know, on the first period who, uh, of, the, uh, of the classroom, who should have the pencil second. And then I would always argue, I have a math so a math class, can I have the pencil? Because I need to take notes. And then 
you know, we, we would really just have to survive off of one or two meals a day just because this was the reality of millions of children who lived in Iraq. I remember I used to complain about the date syrup sandwich that my mom would make us to school sometimes. And I would say, why do we eat this date syrup sandwich every day to school? And then I was either in first or second grade when I was sitting about to eat my date syrup sandwich, uh, complaining as usual. And then I saw those little two kids, a, a brother and a sister, who in their weary book bag, the, the little sister, she... Um, she tried to pick a little bit of crumbs from the, the bottom of the pocket in her book bag. And then she found a little bit and she put it in her brother's mouth. I still remember the happiness on her face. Um, she could not find any more crumbs for her. Um, so this was the reality of the children. At that moment, I felt thankful that I have that date syrup sandwich. But I wondered, is this the reality of millions of children around the world? Or is this only in Iraq? And I think that was a turning moment for me as a, as a child that I want to do something so I won't have to see children not having food when they go to school. Um, and again, this was just the reality of our world uh, at that time in Iraq. Uh, despite the fact that we're talking about like uh, healthcare services, uh, I barely remember going to a doctor unless it was like something emergency. I barely remember visiting a dentist unless they had to take out my tooth. Um, so this was our reality. Uh, the death of a half million uh, children in Iraq, which this topic was debatable um, some would say it was the uh, propaganda of Saddam Hussein to use against the um, the U.S., and, and some would say it was the reality of our world or, um, at that time in Iraq due to malnutrition. Um, for me, I would say, could the number be fake? It could be, yes. But was this the reality of our time in Iraq? Yes, were children dying from malnutrition, from the lack of medical equipment? Yes. Um, despite the fact that many of my classmates uh, who have lost their fathers during the war with Iran, which lasted from 1980 to 1988, or Kuwait invasion, or the highway of death that also caused the death of um, thousands of Iraqi military personnel, and I, I used to remember going to school, my parents would tell me not to talk about my father, not to mention my father, just simply because many of my classmates don't have fathers. So this was the reality of our world uh, as Iraqis at that time. But I've always heard the word uh, hisar, the hisar will be lifted on Iraq. So I one day had a conversation with my grandfather and I say, can you explain to me what does it mean the hisar will be lifted? And he simply put it in a way where I could understand it. And he explained that when the hisar is lifted, I'll be able to have as many pencils as I wanted. I'll be able to have a new book bag. I'll be able to have a better school. And he put it in a context for me that as a child, I understood that when Hisar is lifted um, from Iraq or on Iraq, I will just have a better life as a, as a child. And then um, I remember one day I was walking in the market with my father and I, I smelled uh, the banana, which I never had before. Like I never tasted it. And it smelled so good. And I asked my father if he could buy me one. I said, well, you know, what what is this called? And he said, it's, it is called banana. And I said, well, it smells too good. Can I, can you buy me one? And I, I remember how Hisar or how the economic sanctions forced my father to lie to me because he simply could not afford buying me a banana. 
And he said, this is fake. It's not, it's not real banana. And I said, but it smells so good to be fake. And he said, but look, it has a sticker. It's fake. I promise one day I'll buy you banana. So these are just like little things that sometimes when we think about places around the world with conflicts and, um, and war zone, we tend to not see and zoom in to see the suffer of children's um, things that we we don't think it's it's important to think about. Um, part of that, for example, the long hours where we did not simply have electricity with the with a very uh, scorching sun of Baghdad. Like right now, it's 120 degrees in Baghdad. The power would go off around 12 a.m. exactly. And we have to stay up until 12 a.m. And then 12 a.m. we'd go on the rooftop. And then we would put our mattresses and then we go to sleep. And that's by then it's around 1, 1 30 a.m. So that's when we go to sleep every single day, dis despite, you know, that we have school next morning, just because we don't have electricity and um, and it's it's very, very hot. Uh, we wake up around 6.30 to go to school, and I do not remember a day that I went to school without really just falling asleep in my classroom. Sometimes we, we have research that talk about the importance of sleep and what does it do to children and how careful we should be. Um, and I just reflect on my own journey. When was, when, when was the last time as a child that I just had a good sleep? a good night's sleep, and I went to school fresh. So these are the little things that we sometimes don't think about. And then the conversation started to happen about the U.S., whether we call it invasion or liberation or occupation or the military operations. Um, I'm not here to label um, the 2003 military operations in Iraq. I will leave it to the audience to decide. I guess whatever I'm going to label it, if I label it, whatever I label it, it's not going to change the reality of what Iraqis lived in Iraq and they're still living up to this day. So we have facts that we can lay out and I leave it up to you to decide. When we're looking at the 2003 invasion, as you see in, in the pictures here, the one on the left, the picture on the left side, I think this is the picture all Iraqis, I believe, um, remember from the 2003 when Baghdad was being bombarded hev heavily in 2003. And then on the right side is the fall of the statue of um, Saddam, uh, Saddam Hussein, which really symbolized the fall of Baghdad or the fall of the Ba'ath regime. For me, I was 14 years old at that time. And my world and reality revolved about my school, my friends, um, my safety and my family's safety. So it seems like with every war, Iraqis and in particular women, they became very um, prepared when it comes to wars, they know what to prepare. And they know what kind of uh, things that they need to do. So the first thing we have, and, and almost every Iraqi house, they have this China um, China cabinet that has all, all of like the glasses in it. So they would have to empty everything out because if a missile would hit by, that's the first thing that will break and it might hurt people in the house. The next thing would be to cover the windows with the blankets. Uh, first, to cover them with tapes and then with the blanket. So if a missile hit by, the shatter of the window is not going to hurt people in the house. Uh, they would store water, a lot of water. They would uh, store food that they know it would last longer, like rice, pasta, potato. Um, avoid things that would go bad easily, like eggs and vegetables, and especially we expect that the power would go off for a long time. Uh, we stack up on, um, on, um, like, um, gasoline to start up like a generator and, um, to light up candles and stuff like that. 
So women became very, very um, experienced during wartime because that was not the first war. Um, starting from the 1980s during the Iran war, uh, during the Kuwait invasion and during the um, economic sanctions, like they've experienced it all. So for me, um, I was still like, I would consider myself a child, 14 years old. All I was thinking about is imagining life after 2003. Um, I personally imagine those tall buildings, um, new Iraq, just new Iraq. I mean, I was born and I grew up under Saddam's regime and all I learned about was the Ba'ath Party, was the President Saddam, which we called him as children, Baba Saddam, Father Saddam. Um, his pictures, Saddam's pictures were everywhere on the first page of every book that we read at school. No, our curriculum. His pictures would center every classroom you enter in our school. Uh, his picture would be at the entry of every school. So for me, Saddam was this invincible man that it's, it's impossible to get rid of Saddam, right? And then adults would be afraid to have this conversation in front of kids. So they would not say anything, just afraid that if if one of us would say anything outside, you know, then the entire family is in trouble. So adults would refrain from sharing their opinions in front of us. And I guess that was just left to our imagination to think whether Saddam's bad, Baba Saddam's bad, or is he a good man? Is he really going to be overthrown by uh, the U.S.-led coalition? And I think I was just thinking about if this is going to be the reality and Saddam would be gone, Baba Saddam will be gone, who is going to replace this empty frame in my classroom? Who's going to replace all of these pictures and statues of Saddam Hussein? I mean, I'm at the age of 14 at that time, and I, Saddam Hussein was the only reality that I know or that I've known. Um, when the war started, as Iraqis and as a child myself, I never thought it will start. I've always thought that last minute something will happen. They would maybe have a negotiation with Saddam Hussein and the war will stop. It will not happen. Um, because there are, all of these other things that were related to 2003 war, including the WMD, the Weapons of Mass Destruction, right? That is why the U.S. is invading Iraq. And if the U.S. is right that Saddam Hussein is, ha is having the Weapons of Mass Destruction, the street talks in Iraq at that time that Saddam was going to use Weapons of Mass Destruction on his own people, as well as during the war. I guess adults, they had their own worries and children, they had their own worries. And um, early mornings, 2003, March, um, I remember my grandfather opened the bedroom's door and he said, get up. The war had officially started. Um, I still did not believe it at that moment that the war started. And the first couple of days, we have not heard a lot of missiles. Um, it was, um, the, the areas and the provinces around Baghdad were being hit and the fights were happening around those areas. But then in a couple of days, that's when we started hearing, um, the missiles in Baghdad, uh, that's when we started, we were watching the news, the Iraqi news channels were showing um, something other than what is the international channels were showing. So the Iraqi national TV was showing that the Iraqi military is still in control. Uh, the Iraqi military is uh, slaughtering 
the U.S.-led coalition as they're trying to enter Baghdad. Uh, however, the international use were coming in a different direction, um, uh, talking about the progress that the U.S.-led coalition were making in Iraq and, and going towards Baghdad. And then the airport battle happened between the Iraqi military and the U.S.-led coalition. And that was that was close by our house. Um, and then the news were coming that Saddam Hussein was going to use the weapons of mass destruction uh, at the airport. And literally just during this entire process, Iraqis are waiting when Saddam is going to use the weapon of mass destruction. And that's just adding another level of anxiety to this war because a lot of people will die. The fall of Baghdad became a reality once we have seen that picture on TV. Uh, people started to express their opinion, um, but people were in dilemma. Um, they were happy that Saddam Hussein was gone and the regime was overthrown. But on the other hand, how do they accept this idea of an invader um, to Iraq? And then... For me, I was just wondering about what is the next step? When am I going to go to school and just see my friends? Uh, are they okay? How many people were killed? Um, just like wondering about all of these information. And I think in, in 2003, two of the coalition provisional authority uh most notable decrees entered into force um early on uh that was in may of 2003 um the order number one which banned the bath party in all forms um which uh, also known as the debathification and then the order number two which dismantled the Iraqi army. Um, later on, some scholars, uh, they blamed it for fueling the insurgency in Iraq. And um, they also said that this what led the country into a chaos up to this day. Because and, and in particular, the second uh, order, which dismantling the Iraqi army Sending armed military trained men home, um, that would fuel the insurgency later on and um, fueled also the civil war that erupted in Iraq in 2006. Personally for me in 2003, and I think one of the highlights that I would like to mention here, again to just give the audience the perspective of many Iraqis who have been in my position who have lost loved ones um that was back in 2004 when we were leaving uh school me and my friends and i still remember my friend when i said goodbye to her we were joking at the school's gate uh talking about tomorrow's homework how are we going to study for history and when are we going to do our homework? As she walked toward the main street, towards the highway to go to her house, I walk, I was walking towards the inner street to go to my house. That's when I've heard a big explosion. That is when um, the convoy of the U.S.-led coalition was targeted right in front of our school. And as a moment of chaos... Um, the military personnel, they opened fire. And all I saw is that my best friend fell to ground. Um, and then she later, she was picked up by a guy who was just driving by the street. He took her to the hospital and I did not know what happened to her. I went home. I was nervous. Um, and then the next day I went to school and I heard that she died. So I think death became the norm in Iraq. One minute you're standing by someone that you love, 
the next minute you lose them. And trauma became just part of our normal life every day. I go back home. My mom asked, what's wrong? My friend died. Sorry to hear that. Do you want to eat? Yeah, I want to eat. We don't talk about these stories because we are anxious waiting to hear who's next. It could be me, could be my father, could be my brother or my sister or our neighbor or my uncle. We're going every time the phone rings, we expect to hear the death of someone. Every time we leave home, we literally say our last goodbyes because we might not make it back home. And that's the norm in Iraq. And especially during um, 2006, that's when the civil war erupted between the Shia and the Sunni. So as one day I went to school in 2005, a friend of mine asked me if I was a Shia or Sunni. And to me, these terms, these two terms were not part of my dictionary. I just did not understand what they meant. And I asked, what, what do you mean? What are these terms mean? And she said, well, what is your last name? And I gave her my last name and she was like, well, you better go ask your parents and understand if you're Shia or Sunni because you will be asked. And that's when I went back home and I asked my dad. I said, Dad, everybody's talking in school about like Shia and Sunni. And like, I don't understand. What does that mean? And what is our last name? Like, what does our last name belongs to? Is it Shia or the Sunni? And my dad explained that he is Sunni and my mom is Shia. So... And he explained the context behind the Shia and the Sunni. And I, I asked him, like, is there, is there like a huge difference in practice? Why I have not seen you or my mom practice anything differently? And, um, he explained that we're both Muslim. We both believe in the same God and we both pray. We both believe in the same book. So those little differences doesn't matter. And uh, he reassured me that that should not be a problem moving on in our life.